Welcome viewers. In our studio today we have the Ambassador of the United States of America to the Gambia, uh, Richard Pascal. Ambassador Pascal, thank you for uh, paying this visit to us on this special day when the United States of America is about to, uh, to, 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 to celebrate the 46th President, Joe Biden. Welcome and thank you for visiting us. Um, I'm going to start by asking this question. The limits of the U.S. democracy has been deeply tested for the past four years uh, with President Donald Trump. And the perception in the Gambia here is that the U.S. beacon as hope for democracy and human rights is seriously eroded. Is that a fair assessment? Well, first, let me just thank you for receiving me today, and I want to thank the Chronicle for uh, your work in reporting on the U.S. election cycle this year and doing such an excellent job. Uh, really, your team has done a fantastic job. Uh, I, I understand why people might draw that conclusion, but I, I disagree. I, I, think, uh, I think what we've seen is, is, is a display of democracy in action. We have Americans who are very passionate about issues, we have Americans who have engaged in record numbers in the electoral process. We have Americans who have volunteered uh, across a wide range of civil society activities and organizations, advancing different causes. And I think in, in point of fact, it, it shows that Americans are passionate about democracy, they are passionate about their constitutional rights and freedoms, and they are passionate about the future of the country. I think what it does show is that there are very deep divisions in the United States and different, different uh, perceptions of where people want the country to go. And I, I think that that, uh, I, I've said this in the context of the Gambian electoral uh, politics, but it also is true for any democracy. This has to be a competition of ideas, uh, appealing to people based on facts uh, and, uh, and seeking to draw support uh, in the democratic, constitutionally based process, uh, it can't be um, uh, it can't be anything other than that, and still call itself democracy. And that's what we've seen in America. It has been controversial. It has certainly, at times, been uh, less ideal in terms of a of a peaceful and 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 good debate. Uh, but I do think, in point of fact, what we've seen is, is the epitome of the de democratic process in terms of popular participation in their own government. And that is the crux of, of democracy. It also shows that uh, even for a country like the United States of America, democracy is, not, is never a done deal. You have, to, you have to go for it, sustain it, and maintain it. Oh, 100% true. I think, uh, I think that that's... That, that is something that uh, we often see around the world, and, and, and including in the United States. This is certainly not the, not the first time where we've had some deep divisions within our society. It's not the first time where we've had some fundamental and foundational differences of opinions that have created uh, you know, passionate responses. Uh, but it does show that it, democracy doesn't stay static. It's not something that you just create one day and it's there. It, uh, you know, it, just as with hum, you know, humanity, we have people who, are, who, who pass through, they are born, they age, and eventually they pass on. Uh, you have to create that passion for democracy in every new generation, and you have to renew that commitment to the constitutional uh, processes and the rule of law. And, and certainly, uh, certainly, I think that that's very true, and uh, if there's one lesson I want uh, people to take away from this, it's that the importance of that. It's that constant investment in the democratic faith in democracy and commitment to democracy. What will it take for America to heal this deep divide that has appeared for the past four years? Well, I, I think one thing that I've been struck by in my engagements with, with, uh, with people is that, um, quite candidly, the importance of just sitting down and having a calm and rational conversation with people who maybe have a different opinion than you do. Uh, and finding a way to do so in a, in a peaceful way. Um, we have unfortunately seen a lot of families broken apart and friendships uh, torn apart uh, over differences on policy, uh, which, which is regrettable. Uh, we need to be able to debate the, the topics of the day in a, in a, in a calm manner, and, and as I said before, make it a competition of ideas. 
And at the end of the day, break bread together, share a meal together, and enjoy each other's company, even if we don't necessarily agree on everything. Um, what is the state of the relationship between America and the Gambia? Uh, we have a, a, a fantastic bilateral relationship. Uh, have been able to meet with uh, His Excellency the President and Her Excellency the, Excellency the Vice President, as well as many different cabinet ministers on a regular basis. Uh, but importantly, our relationship is not just with uh, the government. Our relationship is with the people. And uh, we also are really privileged to have an opportunity to meet with the many different civil society organizations and non-governmental organizations with uh, small business men and women, uh, young entrepreneurs who are really doing some phenomenally creative uh, work in small business, um, and, and just a lot of Gambians who are very passionate for a democratic future that uh, respects human rights, fund fund fundamental human and political rights, and, and want to see a brighter future and are willing to invest their time, effort, and, and a, lot of, a lot of sweat into making that happen. And so uh, we have a good relationship and it, it's, uh, it's on all of those levels as I mentioned before. We will uh, touch the human rights aspect uh, a little later in the interview. Uh, one important aspect of the relationship between America and the Gambia uh, might transpire from uh, the 2021 Defense uh, Authorization Act, in which the U.S. will now require the true beneficial owners of companies to identify themselves. How can this help the Gambia to lift the veil on the assets of uh, the former president of the Gambia, Yaya Jame, some of which have been frozen by the United States of America? You know, that's a great question. Let me just uh, say that this is, a, this is a relationship that began early in the, the current Gambian administration and a partnership, a law enforcement partnership to support Gambian efforts to investigate uh, financial crimes uh, through the, uh, the commission, more commonly known as the Johnny Commission, of course. Uh, and that was a, a partnership not just uh, with the United States government and federal law enforcement, but also with other key partners that support uh, this transition to transparent, accountable, dem democratic government governance. Um, fortunately, as a very, very beneficial mutual relationship, uh, and, and in point of fact, we, we believe that the uh, Janet Commission report was very comprehensive and extremely well done. Obviously, then the challenge comes in implementing the recommendations of that report in a, on, a, on a foundation of rule of law. And, and obviously there is the requirement and the need to, uh, to have a transparent process to do so. And, and that is where it becomes more challenging. But we do continue to support those efforts. There is ongoing now a legal process. It's appeared uh, obviously in the Gambian news media of a, of a large home in, in suburban, in Maryland, in the suburbs of Washington, DC, uh, that uh, we have shown, we believe, uh, beyond any reasonable doubt, uh, it was purchased with uh, ill-gotten proceeds of, of corruption um, by the Jame family uh, and has been uh, frozen, that asset has been frozen pending disposition through the rule of law process in the United States. And we are, of course, working with the Gambian government for the Gambian equities in that process. Uh, there have been other sanctions, as you know, levied against the former president and his wife and some other persons who were close to him who were part of uh, the uh, coordinated conspiracy to commit corruption on a, on a variety of levels. So we hope that this, uh, this law will, will help to, to, to unmask them. The, uh, really the intent of that law was to try to ensure that uh, the, the provenance of different corporate interests are, are publicly stated and known. Uh, and it was really more aimed at uh, what we call global power competition, which is where we are finding that there are occasionally companies that have financial interests or other controlling interests from countries that are very public in their desire to do us ill. So uh, that was really the intent of that legislation. Okay, good. Uh, so you've been in the Gambia since March 2020. What is your assessment of the post jame era? Uh, just a correction, I, I arrived in March of 2019. Uh, so I've been here almost two years now. It's hard to believe it's almost been two years. Quite frankly, the situation with COVID has made time go uh, in some ways much faster and in other ways much slow, more slowly. Uh, I find an energy and a vibrance in the Gambia and a passion for the future of this country uh, that, that really is unrivaled. Uh, 
uh, I find a, a deep appreciation and desire for for uh, you know, good, transparent, accountable, democratic governance. And I find people that are really interested in understanding better uh, what that means in the Gambian context. Because this is different in every country. And how, based on you know, the Gambia's history and traditions, how, how does that manifest itself in Gambian law, the new draft Gambian constitution, which obviously, as we all know, there is an ongoing mediation effort to try to resolve differences over that. And, and, uh, and I find that there's just a tremendous energy here. As I said before, young Gambian entrepreneurs who are really doing creative things in business, establishing networks across Africa and, and uh, overseas with uh, potential uh, business partners, uh, and of course, uh, uh, increasing confidence, I think, in the, in, the, uh, in the future of the Gambia. Now, COVID-19 has been a, a real heavy blow. Uh, it's been a heavy blow around the world. Certainly, it's been a heavy blow in my country. It has created some significant economic disruptions here in the Gambia, no doubt. Uh, I know a lot of people who are really struggling economically and financially right now due to the hit on tourism in particular. And, and of course, um, um, that is something that, that, that I'm sure the Gambia, as other countries, will struggle with for, for several years as we seek to recover from the impact of COVID-19. I do think the government took some really important uh, immediate steps. Uh, but I would be remiss if I did not comment that you and I are sitting uh, maybe a meter apart, so we have our face coverings on, our masks on. And, uh, but I, I just urge Gambians, uh, most Gambians when you're driving down the road or, or, or going by a market are not wearing face coverings. Uh, businesses that have signs up that say no mask, no entry, don't seem to be asking people to put masks on. Uh, when I go into those businesses, um, people or most people, if not all people, are not wearing masks, including the staff of business establishments that should be. And I would just urge that there be a, a, a re rededication on the part of the Gambian public to the very basic preventive measures that the Ministry of Health has published. And, uh, and I would urge that that, uh, that that be made a priority. You talked about the energy from the Gambian people, uh, their desire to get the country at a better stage. But it seems that that's not what the public decision maker is taking. That's, that's, that's the government. Uh, you've mentioned the general commission. The implementation is a problem. The constitu draft constitution, it was kind of uh, dropped until people have to put pressure to get it revived and so on. Uh, the TRRC, there are fears that the timeline might be too short for the recommendations to be implemented and, and, and so on. What is your assessment of all, all that? It seems like the government seems to have a small disconnect with the population, the, the, the need, the, the, the will of the Gambian people to move forward. Uh, I think first of all, I would observe that the, the breadth and depth of the reforms uh, that have been undertaken uh, by the government are, are really uh, unprecedented, I would argue. Uh, this is a small country. It's, it's a pretty small government when it comes down to it. And unfortunately, in, in many respects, based on a lot of different analyses, uh, the government had been, uh, uh, I guess, developed over a period of two decades to, to really be focused on and serving the interests of a very small subset of people. Uh, and so um, it, it takes some time for those reforms to take hold. It is important. The Gambian people uh, are, are watching, and uh, there, is an, there is an electoral process coming up. And of course, it is at the polls where the voters get to hold accountable their elected representatives. I've said this in, in other venues, but I would just emphasize that the National Assembly members are elected, most of them, uh, by the people. Uh, their constituents can and should contact their National Assembly members to express their concern over, over any matters that go before the National Assembly to include the Constitution draft. Uh, to include, uh, there are numerous pending pieces of legislation, including an anti-corruption bill that would create a, an anti-corruption commission. And uh, if I hear one repeated theme from Gambians I talk to, it's their concerns about increasing corruption in the country. Um, there is pending legislation to overhaul uh, the criminal, uh, criminal code, the criminal procedure code that is still pending in the National Assembly. There are any number of pieces of draft legislation that, that require debate and passage uh, by the National Assembly in order to uh, implement many of these different reforms that Gambians themselves are clamoring for. Uh, but again, the ultimate accountability comes at the ballot box. So uh, I urge Gambians just to stay informed, stay engaged. 
uh, and to make their voices heard. And then uh, when it comes time to go to the polls, make sure if you're going to be 18 in December of this year, make sure you know how to register to vote and you register as soon as those registration processes begin. Um, since November 2020, Gambians are required to pay $15,000 bond, $15, bond uh, to be issued an American visa. Why, why, why the Gambia specifically? Thank you for asking me that question. Uh, and, and I just want to clarify. Uh, unfortunately, there was a news report that went out about this uh, before all the facts had been released by the U.S. government. Uh, it was a news report by one of the major international wire services that unfortunately dominated the, the, the news cycle. Um, in point of fact, not all Gambians, uh, this is not a bond that all Gambians would pay to receive a visa. Uh, this is a, this is a, a bond, it's, a, it's an element of U.S. law, which has actually been in the law for decades, that persons who are ineligible for an existing reason, someone who has been deemed ineligible to receive a visa, if there is a compelling interest for them to receive a temporary visit visa, then they can apply for or request an application for a waiver to be accompanied by payment of a bond. And of course, the bond is really intended to be a bit of an assurance, financial stake, for that person to return following that visit. It's a bit of a lengthy process, but it does not apply to all Gambians who might apply for a visa. Mm -hmm. uh, the last question is, the 2020 U.S. Treasury Department uh, specially designated nationals and block person continues to mention some name like Mohamed Bazi, uh, like Kanafer Hisham, like the Colombian fag rebel Edison Romana, does that mean that those people continue to be having the Gambia as a safe haven? Or does the U.S. believe that those people continue to have connections with the Gambia? Because their name has been directly attached to the Gambia. Well, for each individual, you need to look at what the, the, the public release was on why they were designated uh, under these provisions of U.S. law. And it just varies. Uh, but this is not a designation specific to the Gambia. These are global designation processes. In some cases, these are people who have had or, or continue to have or, or may continue to have financial interests and ties and other types of ties to the Gambia and uh, that we have identified as having violated, uh, in most cases, not just U.S. law, but in often cases, uh, and oftentimes it's international law. And uh, in some cases, these are people who have been identified and, and shown to have provided financial support to known and designated, internationally designated terrorist groups and organizations. In other cases, it's just involvement in kleptocracy. It's involvement in the theft of public funds and in corruption. And so it really depends on the individual designation. But that's in general why these designations are made. These are, are quite effective when it comes to making it at least far more difficult for those individuals to take advantage of the international financial system uh, for their nefarious activities. And so that's really the intent. In most cases, we are uh, joined by other international, other countries in the international uh, scene and international organizations in many of these uh, types of designations. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that we have Fatou Bom Ben Souda, the current international criminal court prosecutor, her, will we have her name removed from that list? You know, I, 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 I certainly am looking, at, uh, looking forward to seeing what evolves in terms of that relationship with the ICC. Um, there are some legitimate concerns, I think, uh, and it certainly are, my government believes there are legitimate concerns about the investigation that was launched and the way it was launched. We have made those concerns known, uh, not just in private to, uh, to uh, the chief prosecutor and other members of the ICC uh, leadership, but, uh, but also in public statements. So, uh, our position is well known, uh, and, uh, and we'll see where this goes in the future. Mm -hmm. Ambassador, we thank you so much for visiting the Chronicle. Uh, my privilege. Thank you so much for the invitation. You're welcome. Thank you, viewers. Mm -hmm.